Okay, great. Um, I think we're just going to go ahead and get started as um, some uh, additional people are joining. Um, but welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Catherine Ely. I am the uh, project manager for the Waste Management and Measuring Reverse Logistics Environmentally Sustainable Procurement and Transport and Circular Economy Project, otherwise known as the REC. We like to call it the REC simply because it's a much shorter acronym um, than the full. And uh, we, we use the Environmental Sustainability and Humanitarian Logistics um, summary to, to summarize it. So today uh, we are basically giving an update from the, the HMPW session that we held last year uh, on where the project has ended. We do have some new team members this year. So I'm very excited that you're going to get uh, introduced to, to my new colleagues uh, who've joined us. Can you go to the next slide, please? And before we get started um, with a, a little bit of a presentation, we wanted to show you this video, which gives us a great summary of sort of what the project is uh, and a little bit about what our uh, objectives are. So enjoy. Humanitarian actors are committed to the principle of do no harm. However, during an emergency, adverse environmental impacts can result from well-intended life-saving humanitarian action. Humanitarian logistics operations, including transport of humanitarian supplies, procurement and warehousing, can lead to waste generation, production of greenhouse gas emissions and pollution. These impacts can hamper the effectiveness of relief, recovery and sustainable development efforts and make them more costly. They can also affect the health and livelihoods of crisis-affected communities and of humanitarian workers for years and years after an emergency. We need to reduce those harmful impacts, however, no single organization can tackle this challenge alone. That's why the humanitarian community came together and launched the RAC project. The Global Logistics Cluster-led RAC project aims at providing guidance to the humanitarian community on green logistics and the best practices to reduce the adverse environmental impacts associated with humanitarian operations. The project is funded by the DG ECHO, USAID and the UPS Foundation and relies on a network of more than 500 logistics cluster partners to share information, challenges and green activities for the benefit of the entire humanitarian logistics community. It is coordinated by the Global Logistics Cluster with a coalition of partner organizations including the Danish Refugee Council, Save the Children International, the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies and the World Food Programme. To reduce the impact of supply chain operations on the environment, it's important to focus on waste management and innovation, circular economy and reverse logistics, environmentally sustainable procurement, and greenhouse gas emissions. The REC team will provide dedicated environmental advisors with expertise in those key areas, supporting humanitarian community. Thank you, Francesca. Um, great. So that's just a, a very brief sort of overview of what the REC project is. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit about um, what we've been doing in the past year with our team. Um, but first, I, in terms of the goals of the REC project, we're really trying to focus on waste and greenhouse gas emissions and increase the in, in knowledge and awareness. So I like to think of the REC project really as an awareness raising project and a, a change management uh, project, because in a lot of context, um, you know, field-based logistics practitioners have heard of environmental sustainability, but don't necessarily know uh, the concepts of circular economy, for example, reverse logistics. They, they know basic uh, information about waste management, but we really want to bring together the expertise of the environmental specialists on the REC project, of course, but also the expertise of, uh, of all of the logistics cluster and coalition partners' um, knowledge and uh, different initiatives that are taking place to better guide um, a sustained adoption of uh, best environmental practices for the humanitarian logistics community. So if you go to the next um, slide, please, Francesca. So if we talk about what we've been really working on for the past year, and I have to say, um, we began the project um, a, a little bit over a year ago, and we had a dedicated team of about three quarters of a person <laughs> for, uh, for a very extended period of time, but we are very excited to welcome on uh, a, a much more full team right now. 
in the past year, we've we've published 104 information products on the uh, REC information platform. So we're very proud of that. Now, that's not to say that um, the REC team uh, has produced 104 information products, but looking at you know our overall goal of um, collaborating with different partners um, and consolidating information from the humanitarian logistics community, a lot of those documents and most of those documents um, have been produced by our partner organizations. Um, whether it be, um, you know, a compendium of best practices in different areas um, or it's case studies um, that, that partners have, have conducted. If it's relevant for the humanitarian community, we collect that information from partners and we share it via the information uh, platform. We've also held a number of different workshops and information sessions. Um, in the past year, we have done uh, 15 on various different topics. Now, whether that's panels with thought leaders, whether that's uh, presentations of green procurement, for example, we held a green procurement workshop last year, um, various different topics. And all of these are guided by uh, our partners and what our partners are sort of asking us for in terms of help um, and what our partners are doing uh, in terms of different uh, initiatives on environmental sustainability. Um, we have held some, some grain procurement coordination meetings. So following the workshop that we held last year on grain procurement, um, it was really very evident to us as the, the project team at that time that there's a lot of activities take, taking place in grain procurement. And so there's um, a risk of sort of duplication of efforts and overlap. So what we're doing is we're, we're holding regular uh, grain procurement coordination meetings with those working group leads and different thought leaders on that topic to make sure that everybody is updated on what people are doing on grain procurement activities and we're coordinating with each other to avoid that duplication and overlap. Um, very exciting uh, work that's being done right now with our partners and particularly the joint initiative um, is our uh, waste management and recycling infrastructure assessments. Now, this is essentially providing information on what facilities are available in country. So we're looking at um, you know, waste management in terms of landfills, um, what's happening in terms of recycling, what different companies are available to give field-based practitioners the, the information and sort of a baseline that they need to make informed waste management decisions. So we've mapped out 17 uh, and embedded that into the log IE map. You'll see the, uh, the image there of the log IE map, which is on our information portal as well. And in terms of collaboration with um, academia, um, Francesca, can you go to the next slide? We have published a waste management and reverse logistics in the humanitarian context uh, qualitative study that we produced with uh, in collaboration with the Hunkin School of Economics Hunlog Institute last year, which is available on our website. And we're currently working with the Kuna Logistics University on a quantitative study measuring the impact of humanitarian logistics activities in terms of waste management and greenhouse gas emissions on the environment. And that's slated to be finalized in um, July of this year. So please uh, look out for that. It's gonna be very exciting information. And we will of course hold an information session with the Kuna, Kuna Logistics University folks uh, once that's available. So I'm conscious of time and I do want to hand over to the rest of my team. So please uh, welcome, uh, join me in welcoming all of my team members, um, you can see their names on the screen here, but they're going to introduce themselves. Um, I believe I'm handing over to Michaela first. I think oh, it's sorry, Francesca, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you so much. You know, now that the team is expanding, we, get, we can get easily confused. So thank you so much for joining us today and uh, for uh, joining the efforts of the REC project and trying to, le to learn a little more about this uh, environmental effort that we are jointly taking with other humanitarian organizations to have a long-term vision, which should be achieving clean, environmentally sustainable humanitarian supply chains. I would like to uh, share a couple of inputs about information management for the project. In, uh, in a way, I would like to remark that this project uh, is actually embedded in the Global Logistics Cluster vision of uh, providing a service provision mindset. So we want to remember to all the stakeholders that the REC project is here and that is actually uh, serving all the humanitarian organizations needing uh, environmental guidance or environmental support to reduce their environmental impacts. And uh, for this reason, we actually welcome your requests, your challenges, your success stories, any 
inputs that you would like to share to allow us to grow the network of the humanitarian partners via the global out outlook account that we have, the global.reg at wfp.org. And also, I would like to um, uh, highlight the fact that we are trying to collect the inputs of the humanitarian uh, organizations since uh, everybody is facing different challenges, but we have a common objective, which is uh, reducing the environmental impacts uh, uh, altogether, possibly following different work streams. And to understand which are the priority work streams of your organizations, we launched a baseline survey in September 2022. I am going to talk about the results uh, shortly. And also I would like to um, highlight that we have a midterm uh, project survey that is open right now. And Margot is kindly sharing the link to the survey right now in the chat so that we can capture what has been the evolution of your uh, challenges over the last six months. If something changed, if there is something that we can do for you, if there is something that we haven't foreseen so far, please let us know. At the same time, always with the objective to share scalable solutions and to make partners know what is working and what is not working across the sector, we are collecting field success stories, stories from the field. We started with the DRC, uh, with the Fair Recycling Project Initiative, which was posted on the Global Logistics Cluster blog. And we would like to give visibility to other success stories, uh, let's say all along, humanitarian supply chains from the reduction of single use plastics in packaging to the uh, reduction of waste streams and uh, adoption of waste management practices leading to better environmental footprints. So please, if you have a success story, just reach out to global.rec and we are going to make sure to give you a voice and give you a channel where you can actually talk about your update. So uh, about the channels that we have available to actually amplify your messages, of course, there is the REC platform. And as uh, Catherine uh, rightfully said, we have more now more than uh, 104 resources that are hosted on the platform. And of course, we didn't produce them all. It was actually you, the main producers, you, the community of humanitarian organizations, which actually contributed to, shred, to shred light over the challenges that we are all facing. So please continue to share your resources with the REC project and we will make sure that uh, we can connect the dots in the end and um, stop working in silos where we can actually collaborate and create positive impacts for the whole humanitarian community. So finally, last but not least, two other information management products that we are maintaining are the monthly readers digest and i hope that you didn't get tired of it because you're going to see more and more of them coming over the next few months so we are actually enriching it and we started actually preparing also an online visual version of the mailing of the newsletter starting from the last month and we are sharing it contextually to the readers digest so every time that you get the reader digest on outlook you will also get as way presentation with pictures and possibly a little more engaging user experience. And uh, I would like to remark the fact that uh, whatever we produce in terms of communications uh, within the REC project is the fruit of a collaborative project pro process with other organizations. And how are we doing this? Actually, we launched uh, um, in September 2022, the Communication Council, which is actually a forum where representatives from uh, the communication units from IFRC, the Danish Refugee Council, Save the Children, and WFP, and the Log Cluster are actually meeting. And we try to decide what is the vision and what is the outcome that we want to achieve every month in terms of communications. And then we share the news uh, across the uh, across a Teams channel, let's say, and a Trello board, so that everybody can be up to speed with what we want to achieve across the humanitarian community. Now, I feel like I've been uh, speaking a lot, but just a couple of uh, remarks on the REC baseline survey results. So this might be actually useful, especially in the light of the new midterm survey that we launched and whose results are going to be analyzed in May. But uh, from our understanding, with 108 individuals from 60 organizations responding to the baseline survey, most of you told us that your priority area of interest right now is green procurement, followed by waste management, circular economy, greenhouse gas emissions, and reverse logistics. So we are going to try to tailor direct guidance, especially now that the team is expanding and we have uh, Michaela and Marta joining us on the circular economy and waste management front. 
we will try to focus our um, efforts, let's say, to provide you what you need to overcome uh, challenges in these priority areas, as well as in the other work streams. Now, mm, let me please make it a little more engaging now and stop talking so much. So if possible, I would kindly ask you to go to www.menti.com and use uh, the code 22331844 and let us know what environmental sustainability topics are a priority for your organizations. I will give you one minute, something like that, to possibly connect and uh, register your responses. We're gonna have two questions on the Menti quiz and we will discuss the results all together at the end of the presentation once we launch the Q&A space. So please, www.menti.com, code 22331844. Great, and while people are doing that and logging into the Menti, if anybody has any questions or comments on the presentation uh, throughout, please feel free to put them in the chat. We will be opening up to Q&A at the end of the session um, and we can um, address them at that point. And also, if you haven't done so yet, please do introduce yourself, your name and organization in the chat as well. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And uh, as the results are coming through, I'm gonna just wait for another couple of seconds and then we are gonna move to the next slide for the second question, which is quite relevant for the rec. And I'm going to leave the second question open during the whole duration of the presentation. So you can keep on logging into Menti and just add your inputs as far as we go, okay? So here we go. Now we change question. How can the REC support you to achieve your sustainability goals? Thank you for uh, just keeping on uh, providing inputs. And as I said, it's going to be open all along the presentation. So no worries. It's a... Uh, it's open and we are going to discuss the results together at the end of the presentation, okay? Thank you so much. I'm just gonna give you a couple of questions in order to make sure that you are logging in and that uh, everything is working correctly. All right. And now, thank you so much. Please keep on uh, uh, responding to the Menti quiz all along the presentation. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Michaela Bolzino. Please, Michaela, uh, teach thanks. us something about circular economy now. Thanks, Francesca. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Michaela Bolzino. I'm an environmental engineer with uh, over eight years of experience in the humanitarian context. In these eight years, I've worked and collaborated uh, with several UN agencies. I started with WFP in Rome, then in Kenya, Somalia. Uh, I then moved to uh, New York, working for the Department of Operational Support uh, as a sustainable supply chain officer. I briefly collaborated with UNICEF in Copenhagen, and I'm finally back uh, with uh, WFP. Uh, my professional experience focused uh, on uh, uh, supply chain with a focus on sustainability and circularity. First of all, because it's my big passion and interest personally and professionally. And uh, also because it's a hot topic and more and more organizations and agencies are interested in this uh, uh, circular and uh, sustainable concept to apply in their operation. And for this reason, I'm very happy to be the circular economy uh, specialist of uh, the REC project, uh, which uh, is quite exciting for me. But before uh, to uh, understand what a circular economy is, let's look at what a linear economy is. Because at the moment, uh, the humanitarian logistics mainly operate using a, a linear uh, economy, a linear model, where we purchase natural resources,
think we're losing the connection with Michaela. Mm -mm. Might be. Yeah. Some technical difficulties. Let me send her a, a text and see if she can see it. Okay. In the meantime, why don't we? I'm going to mute her. Um, we why design don't we, and we produce our product, we distribute, we use, and at the end, we dispose it. It's a very yeah, I think we've we've lost her completely. Um, can we go ahead and move along to 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 Marta, and we can come back. I will chat with um, Michaela and see if we can overcome some technical challenges. Apologies for that. Sure. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and my name is Marta Kucharski, and I recently joined, so yesterday, basically, the REC project as an envi uh, environmental specialist on the waste management component and under the WFP uh, coalition partner. Um, my background is in environmental science, and I'm a waste management specialist. I work on the humanitarian and development context supporting municipalities, uh, NGOs, UN agencies uh, directly or through coordination platforms uh, on improving the waste management systems and infrastructure in uh, host communities and refugee camps. And I also work a lot with the uh, uh, recycling, uh, informal recycling sector and the recycling sector, mapping them and linking them with the formal sectors, but also with the operation, uh, humanitarian operations. And I think that's uh, an important uh, stakeholder we have to consider when we plan our internal waste management systems. Um, and today, uh, besides introducing myself, I also wanted to share some of the key topics and questions that are important not only for the logistics sector but in general from a waste management perspective for any sector and teams uh, working in the field and uh, i also wanted to take the opportunity to get some feedback from from you uh, if there is any specific area you would like to highlight or any area that may be missing and I also put a lot of pictures uh, and examples uh, from Cops's Bazaar uh, humanitarian response uh, because that's where I was based for the last uh, four years and I had the opportunity to work on a fully dedicated project on waste management that time uh, with the UNDP and I think that there were a lot of learnings from all the partners working there that were, were worth sharing it uh, for the presentation today. Um, so when we plan our uh, waste management systems from our organizations, I think that there are two key questions that are important to respond. The first one is how do we handle our uh, waste stream, each waste stream? And to that, I think that first of all, it's important to go for a waste characterization of, um, in, of our uh, organization to know the type, quantities, and where this waste is uh, generated to understand the whole picture and be able to uh, set priorities and, and plan our uh, system. And then and for each waste stream, and this is what uh, it's linked to what Michaela was saying about the circular economy, so she will cover it later. Um, but for each waste stream, uh, um, some of the items may, may be returned to the suppliers. Um, and maybe others are uh, reused. And I put here uh, some example of this uh, pot that was used by the uh, refugees uh, to collect the cereals from the nutrition centers. Um, then uh, we may explore if there is any livelihood project from where we can uh, supply our waste and it can be used for recycling. And this is the example of these uh, plastic bags um, of bags that were made of some food packages and, and that uh, were made of some kind of multi-layer plastic and laminated plastic that was not possible to recycle in, in uh, Bangladesh. Or we can link to the recycling sector, invite them to our compounds and ask them or see if there is any valuable waste that they could uh, take and uh, supply to the recycling factories. And this is an example of these uh, oil bottles that were distributed in the response 
that became uh, an item for the recycling sector during the emergency. Uh, or we can store the waste uh, in our uh, compounds until we find a better solution, or there may be other options. And then for the waste that cannot fit under any of these options, we need to find a proper place uh, and a proper way to manage and dispose it. And here is where we have to look at the, if there is any existing public or private service or infrastructure that can accommodate uh, our waste. Or maybe there is any other um, humanitarian sector uh, waste management facility that we can, um, uh, where we can dispose of the waste or we can work together or even to construct our own facilities. And here I just wanted to put this example also in Cox's Bazaar that uh, it was constructed a landfill that uh, for the, all refugee camps that uh, were all the waste from the, uh, the refugees and, and the sectors could could be uh, um, uh, used, uh, but it was only for waste that was not recyclable or compostable. So only for the remaining waste that had no other solutions. And uh, we can go for to the next slide. And the second question uh, that I think that's important to respond is, uh, uh, which are the challenges that our field teams are facing? And of course, it will depend on the country where we are operating and the level of development of the waste management sector and the existing of policies, regulations, systems, infrastructure that will determine the level of awareness and practices of the communities, but also maybe of our team workers. And then that's, uh, it may have an impact also on, on the level of understanding of uh, or capacities or motivation to be engaged on, on adding in their work uh, the, the or, on planning or implementing the solid waste management systems we are trying to put. So uh, I think that from the very beginning is important to engage them on describing, on defining the waste management systems of our organization to build their understanding on what they are contributing and why it is important and also to find solutions uh, together. And here, I just wanted to uh, throw this idea of looking for expertise from the field. Um, and this was the case also in, in Cox's Bazaar where the wash sector partners were supporting other sectors on dealing with uh, their own waste. So the wash sector was leading an intersector uh, waste management group that was participated by every uh, sector lead and where it was a platform to discuss all the challenges uh, that all the sectors were facing on waste and from where it, there were a lot of new synergies and uh, good discussions. And uh, the, the idea was that all, all the um, sectors were, were together to, to face the issue of the, the waste management. Um, and here there is this picture of uh, this joint assessment um, participated by the logistic and the voice sector partners. So just to wrap up, I think that as a key message is uh, to, to, to look at ways as an issue that it's uh, uh, not only affecting logistic, but also all the uh, partners in the field. So it's good to work together and find expertise from the field. Um, then uh, that we need to know our waste, uh, our waste streams, and also it's important the participation of all our mem team members in the in defining and implementing our uh, waste management systems. So that's all I wanted to share, and happy to answer questions later. Thank you. Thank you so much, and. Uh... Marta, I guess that, uh, yeah, this is extremely interesting and thank you so much for sharing the case studies. Maybe we can see now if uh, Michaela is uh, back online and if she can uh, get back to her side of the presentation. So, sure. Can you hear me now? Oh, okay, that's how that works this time. I'm sorry. All right. Okay, while Francesca is uh, working with the presentation, I will, okay. 
um, I don't know exactly what you heard before, but I will. I wanted to explain you very briefly what a linear economy is, just to compare with a circular economy. Uh, very briefly, a linear economy is the way of operating that many agencies and NGOs are using at the moment, where we purchase natural resources, we design, we produce the product, we distribute, we use, and we dispose it at the end of the process. And uh, the, it has this linear economy is very simple, but it has big impact on the environment and on the consumption of natural resources, which are not infinite. Um, on the other hand, uh, to go more sustainable, we should introduce some circularity in the, this chain. Uh, Francesca, please go ahead. Um, exactly. And we can do this using the three pillars, the three R pillars, which are reduce, reuse, and recycle. Reduce is a, a pillar that we can adopt throughout all the process, uh, throughout all the different phases. When we think about how we design uh, and how we produce our product and how we consume it, we can reduce the amount of natural resources that we use. We can uh, reduce the energy that we consume. We can reduce the CO2 that we, uh, we produce during this process. When we are thinking instead of the concept of a reuse and recycle, this will focus more on maintaining the same product over and over again in the same circle. And this to minimize the amount of uh, waste produced and the of, uh, amount of products that are disposed at the end of the process. And this is to go and to shift from a linear model to a circular model. Francesca, go ahead, please. Exactly. And we can see again, there is the circularity, the product stays within the circle, and only a minimal amount of product goes to the waste management cost. Uh, when we talk, uh, but when we talk about circular economy, the model is very broad and it's very complex, and uh, there are so many aspects that we can talk about here. I have just a few minutes to talk about that. And I would like just to let you understand that when we talk about circular economy, we can talk about several aspects and, and that can be applied in the different stages and the different phases of uh, this circle. For example, when we talk and when we look at the design and the production phases, we can think about applying green procurement practices. When we look at the distribution and the use, we can think about using reverse logistics to maintain, again, the same product within the circle. But why we should use a circular economy? Why we should do this? First of all, uh, it's very clear. Uh, it's uh, more green and it creates uh, environmental benefits. But uh, that's not only that, because it can create also economic benefits, especially in the long term. But it's not easy. That's very clear. It's easy to explain, but it's not easy to implement. In fact, there are many challenges. Francesca, go ahead, please. And uh, um, when we talk about challenges, we are talking about, first of all, initial investment. Um, the circular economy in the long term can bring benefit, benefits related to the economy of the agency, but at the beginning, a big investment is needed. Another challenge is the lack of expertise. To perform this shift from linear to circular, we need people that know how to do it. We need people that guide the organization on the several stage, uh, stages to perform this change. And then there is the need of a change of, change of mindset, that this sometimes is the biggest challenge of all of them. But uh, don't worry, uh, again, this is not easy. And to adopt a circular economy, it takes time. It's not something that changes from one day to another one. And I'm here to support you on this. Uh, um, as a the circular economy specialist. In my role, I will create awareness across the community. I will prepare training. I will prepare tools and guidance to perform this change. But also uh, the idea is to collect, to map uh, initiative and good practices and to share uh, amongst the community. But also I will be here to brainstorm together and to understand how we can uh, perform this shift in your single organization and how can we share this practice uh, amongst all of us. Um, I'm happy to be here. I will not go uh, much longer and I uh, just wanted to explain you very briefly what a circular economy is and which will be my role. And uh, I would like to hand over to the next one. Hope that you could hear me this time. Absolutely. Thank you so much. 
Um, Francesca, can you move to, I believe, um, Margo? Yes, exactly. Yes. Margo, please go ahead. I'll just do my presentation quite quickly so we can dive into the results. Um, so I'm Margo Rufo. I just graduated from Hankin, uh, master's where I uh, study uh, medical waste management in Bangladesh, and I will expand my research with uh, But before uh, diving into this journey, I uh, really wanted to understand how uh, can we practically do it in the real world? Because, of course, there has been some research about it academically, but I don't know anything about the field. So um, I joined the REC in March 2023, um, just for six months, but it already gave me a great understanding of the differences uh, between what I could write and what could be done. And I uh, had the opportunity to of a medical waste management guide which is exciting and uh, I can't wait to work on other projects with the REC just try and um, see how sustainable practices can be implemented in the humanitarian so now uh, Francesca will continue with your results Thank you so much. And that was very a very quick presentation. Thank you, Margot. And uh, actually, thank you, Michaela, for uh, catching up on your part so quickly and lively, I would say. So now let's have a look all together to the results that you were providing to the Mentimeter and see what are the priority areas of interest and what are the challenges that uh, the REC can actually help you with. So. For what environmental sustainability topics that are a priority for your organization, we saw uh, waste management, circular economy, sustainable procurement coming up as the first uh, results. But interestingly, there is traceability, food production, medical waste, scope three emissions. That's a big one. It's uh, quite a hot topic in the humanitarian sector right now and lots of methodologies are being uh, piloted, let's say, to really make sure that we account for scope three emissions in uh, the, the carbon accounting uh, exercises, procurement, logistics, transport emissions. That's great. And maybe at this point, I would like to start opening the floor because we have two slides and it's true, but uh, I, we can start and check. Uh, if there are any reactions or anybody who would like to share any uh, suggestions, let's say, on the, on the work streams that we identified so far or on the presentation from our colleagues from the REC. So opening the floor for discussion. Thanks, Francesca. I haven't seen any questions um, in the chat as of yet, um, but I think just to maybe sort of get us uh kick us, kick us off and get us started um sustainable procurements and circular economy and waste management seem to be the three um largest areas on the on the the menti in terms of feedback and i i do recognize that we don't have a, a green procurement specialist um as of yet on the team um but hopefully that that position will be filled very shortly um but that is one area where we've done um probably the most amount of work so far in terms of coordination with different colleagues uh, is on green procurement activities. And I see a couple of colleagues here on this call who are engaged in those green procurement coordination meetings. And I, I, I'm not going to call anybody out, but uh, if you have any comments uh, that you'd like to share, perhaps, in terms of how um, green procurement coordination has been going and what, uh, what perhaps is needed in that area, um, I welcome you to do so. Similarly with circular economy and waste management, now that we have uh, Marta Michaela on the team, we're gonna be kicking off those uh, coordination meetings um, on those, those two topics as well, so that um, you know, we're in, ensuring that we're avoiding duplication and overlap of, of, of activities. So if anybody wants to add comment to that, I welcome, I welcome it. And if not, maybe we go to the next um, 
the next results of the, the mentee. Sorry, Catherine, can I add, can I say one Thanks. thing about sustainable procurement? Absolutely. Uh, if, 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 for, uh, as a field person, like coming, coming, like working in the field, with mo most of my career with the humanitarian sector, like the one of one of the things I've seen or the challenges I've seen is how to change, and it's part of the presentation as well. <clears throat> how to change, if I may say, the mindset or the culture. Yeah, like you, you, you may have, we may have all the tools, and we know how. Like, uh, if I may say, we we may have the plan for uh, for how we're gonna go next uh, in our initiatives. But also it is uh, what I've seen in the field, it's quite, I don't wanna say uh, well, difficult, but it's quite challenging also to, to change the mindset or, uh, in, in the field as well, like uh, uh, to, save, to save the planet, if I may say. So do you, uh, my, the question is, uh, how do you think uh, like these, eff uh, the, these efforts, it's going to be translated or, or uh, uh, result into making this uh, project or like reaching the ultimate result, if I may say, com uh, without uh, uh, addressing the challenge of changing the mindset and the culture in in the field itself, because we may have, as as I, I'm I'm saying again, sorry for repeating myself, but we may have the tools, we we may know uh, and the experience as well, uh, 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 and the strategy where where to go, but we don't know how to change the mindset. And I've seen that in the in the in the field where sometimes people is is difficult or challenging to to change in, in this part, especially in the developing countries. Thank yeah. You. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Bessel. And I think um, just to respond to, to that particularly, I think there's a number of different ways that we can we can support uh, a change mindset uh, or change management mindset uh, in terms of environment sustainability. And I think one of the ways that I personally approach it um, and we approach it at the RAC project is that, you know, there are a lot of discussions that, have, that are taking place at present at the global level on um, environment sustainability. Um, but so what? What does that mean for a procurement manager in South Sudan or a procurement officer in, you know, uh, an IDP site? And, and then that's exactly what we're trying to get to with the REC. We're trying to translate all of the different activities and initiatives that are happening at the global level into that so what. And I think we do it in a number of different ways. Um, at, at present, we're trying to do it with the information sessions, which doesn't always meet the, the audience um, and our intended, you know, the impact. Um, but we're also working on a number of different trainings that we're going to be rolling out later in this year to be able to have some of those tools that are already created translated to a, to a more wider audience so that we can reach people uh, better and particularly field-based practitioners. Now, I will say um, with the REC survey that we've just recently sent out, um, it's very key that that reaches our field-based uh, logistics practitioners because it really is an opportunity to say, okay, what do you know about? What don't you know about? What do you need more support on? And how can we do that? Because, you know, the REC, um, I think and what I really like about the project is that we are adaptable. You know, if there is something that uh, that a partner says that they they need in terms of support from, from the cluster and the project, you know, we work to provide that support. So um, it's quite key that we, we do get that feedback. I hope that answered your, your question. Very much, thank you. Very well. Great. And, uh, um, maybe okay. If I can comment on that, uh, sorry, Kat, just quickly jumping in, I would say that Basil's question is quite interesting. And uh, uh, the question, the, the thing is that uh, what normally uh, doesn't, it's not clear in the mind of colleagues, but also of uh, management, I would say at the field level, but even in HQ is that in the end, the final objective of environmental sustainability is not to make everybody's life more costly or to you know, not achieve time savings. I mean, I guess that uh, humanitarian supply chains and logistics are all about optimization, optimization of, on the transport and use of resources. And in the end, uh, the truth is that this objective aligns a lot with environmental sustainability broader objectives, because in the end, we all we want to reduce the number of resources and the way we use them to achieve uh, time savings and possibly also cost uh, 
savings as well. So uh, as soon as we implement measures to make this mindset shift pass and people start seeing that there is a return on investment that is much greater than expected on uh, the initial uh, uh, value of the initiative, I guess that uh, tipping point is reached and we can scale even farther. Sorry, over, Catherine. Over. No, that was great. Thank you very much. That, that very nice compliment. compliment. Um, Hossein, I see that you have a, a question in the chat and you have your hand raised. I, I welcome you to, to, to speak. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I'm Hossein Zori from Coventry University UK, and I've been doing research on uh, sustainable and green uh, humanitarian logistics within the past uh, eight years. Uh, so I just want to echo what, uh, on what uh, Basil said. Um, I think what would be very interesting as the outcome, as the, the distinct outcome of the REC project and what we, uh, at least I'm speaking for myself, I'm close, uh, closely monitoring um, the uh, knowledge that is produced through this project. What would be very interesting for us to see is how we are ad uh, addressing the peculiarities and those specificities in humanitarian sector. Because otherwise we have a very good um, established body of knowledge in terms of uh, circular economy, sustainable procurements, um, um, all these sustainability areas in uh, commercial logistics. How they are translated and how we transfer those learnings to human humanitarian sector and how we are addressing the trade-offs here. For example, um, of course, if we send um, a freight by ship, by ocean, it's going to be much greener, but then there is the matter of urgency sometimes uh, in humanitarian sector. So uh, I think that would be um, the key point or one of the main um, outcomes that um, I'm very expected, uh, I'm uh, very interested to see and expecting to see uh, from the REC project. Yeah, no, thank you very much for that comment. And I think um, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are, in the humanitarian sector, we absolutely have to, our, our core is the humanitarian imperative, right? And so how do we um, meet the humanitarian imperative to save lives and do no harm, um, and also in, in incorporate environmental sustainability? And I think we do that in a number of ways across the, the supply chain, pre-positioning, uh, more greener warehouses, uh, more environmentally sustainable product specifications, um, transport modalities. There's a lot of different ways that we can do that while still maintaining the humanitarian imperative. And I think one of the, the things that we're trying to look at with the REC project is, is particularly that, is learning from the private sector, partnering with academia in terms of different research and, and how we can learn from what is already known on environmental sustainability and supply chains and apply that to the humanitarian sector in particular. Um, I think Michaela and Marta, if you want to jump in here in terms of some examples from your experience as well, I think there are some quite stark differences, I think, in terms of the context in which humanitarians work um, and some of our private sector uh, actors that we can we can make some learnings from. But again, I think you're absolutely right. We do need to be able to trans transform that information and those lessons learned from the different private sector um, into something that's applicable to those various contexts. Um, did Thank you want? You. Yeah, of course. And if anybody else wants to compliment with some some examples, perhaps happy to hand over. Catherine, yeah, I think that also you reply to the question uh, that is in the chat. No, like uh, we should collaborate with the private sector, and we should transform and uh, to get inspired from what they are doing, and to translate their way of operating also in a, for our way of operating. As you mentioned, I mean, for us, it's much more challenges. There are much, many more challenges in doing so, but it's not impossible. In my previous experience, we had some collaboration with private partners in terms of uh, reverse logistics. We ask advice to them, like to, we ask how they were operating in certain contexts that for them were a little bit more challenging. And we, we learned a lot and we were able also to apply the same uh, concept and the same aspect in our operation. But for sure, it's not easy. And... Uh, to answer just to the question how far the circular economy initiative from business sector should be different from the humanitarian sector, it depends. I mean, <laughs> I think that, again, we should get inspired from what the private sector is doing, or we should, yeah, look at what they are doing and to apply in a different context. 
Yeah, for sure. Go ahead, Marta. I see you're yeah. on. Yeah, just to respond uh, the point uh, about how to change the mindsets. And I think that, uh, of course, mindsets cannot be changed from one day to another. Because also, if we look at how we are uh, also managing the waste in, uh, for instance, in Spain, you go to the containers on the streets and still uh, just thinking on the waste management perspective, no? So waste, waste sometimes is still mixed, no? And we have been years and years uh, trying to uh, segregate the waste. But I think that um, that's an important point because um, um, it's what can make our plans to be a reality. And I think that uh, it, what I mentioned before about understanding the challenges, it's also understanding the mindsets they have, the, their motivations, no? And, and their logic on whatever we say uh, or we plan, it may have another translation in, in, in for them, or it, it, they may be uh, hampered by other challenges that are not tangible. So I think that just the communication and, and uh, trainings and discussions, and it's a lot of work that needs to be done in the field with all the partners and working closely. And it may take time, but I think that's... Um, possible and i'm just talking on on more at field level not at uh, mindsets from uh, yeah well in general i think that's uh, in general the mindset that's take, taking time but uh, yeah requires a lot of um, uh, communication and good communication and, and participation yeah no agreed and i think there's a lot of um I mean, what the private sector is doing, um, I mean, of course, directly relates to what humanitarians are, are, are able to do as well. And I, there's a lot of sort of case studies in terms of uh, green procurement and product specifications, for example, um, that directly rely on sort of the private sector to support the development of greener specifications and, and reduced amount of packaging. I don't know if anybody, any of the, the colleagues from uh, the JI are online, but there are some, uh, there are some case studies that, that uh, have been produced in that, that area as well. Um, Taylor, I see your, your hand is raised. If you wanted to go ahead, I welcome you to speak. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Taylor from IOM. Uh, thanks for the session today. Um, I guess this speaks a bit more to the second Menti question about what REC might be able to support with. Um, so I'm just thinking sometimes there's so many components of this sustainability topic, um, sustainable procurement, logistics, but then also waste management. Um, you know, maybe I'm thinking about how do we get people to focus on kind of the highest payout uh, component of that. Uh, we did some analysis at IOM that if we think about plastic sheeting, a lot of that is purchased internationally. Um, and the highest payoff that we've realized is uh, avoiding the air transport of that um, to, to affected countries. Um, as was mentioned, if you transport by sea or road, obviously that's kind of the highest payoff that we can get um, from what we see throughout the entire supply chain. So that um, eclipses all of the sustainable procurement uh, benefits, even the waste uh, management benefits. So based on our, our analysis, if we even if we burned the plastic sheets at the end of their lifespan, um, avoiding the air transport of those would actually um, still save the carbon emissions by over two times um, for that item. So I'm just wondering about, yeah, kind of if REC can help us to quantify where the best payoffs are throughout the supply chain sustainability discussion, I think that would be quite helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, what we're doing at the moment and partnering with academia is to look at some of those studies. We're also looking for examples exactly like you said. So if IOM is doing a study on plastic sheeting, for example, making sure that we're um, we're sharing that information with the broader humanitarian community. And I think in a lot of these cases, I mean, I know with our the qualitative study that we did with the Hunkin School of Economics that's published on the REC, again, going to the so what for the field-based practitioners, what does that mean in terms of the research that's produced, the case studies that are looked at, the life cycle assessments that we have, what does that mean? And what we are trying to do with the REC is really um, translate that into something that is able to be easily understood and easily used. Now, whether that is a, another tool or a training or an uh, information session, it's really, it really just sort of depends on the, the information that we're, we're collecting. Um, but excellent point. And I think it is definitely something that the REC project is, uh, is attempting to, to do. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And just a quick reminder, to all the participants online, you can still feed into the Menti survey. So if you go to www.menti.com, we would really like to hear what can the REC do actually to support you because we see only uh, a few replies, but there are more, much more 
people online. So also, I just wanted to ask if, if the person who wrote, we want to help REC wants to intervene because I really like this type of contribution. If somebody wants to help us, that's great. If somebody wants to share data sets or lessons learned, that's of course uh, uh, the final objective of this project. So feel free to reach out to us, feel free to even intervene now. And uh, otherwise, yes, maybe since we are talking about REC support and the environmental specialists are here just to support, maybe I would leave also to Marta and Michaela some space to express their feelings towards these contributions so far. Um, just before doing that, we have a question in the chat. Uh, maybe I should read it out loud. Uh, it's from Rosalie, or if Rosalie, you want to share it, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yes, Please. hello. Um, so, first of all, um, I was the one who also said we want to help REC. Um, I'm with uh, GS1, we are a standards organization. Uh, we are um, using, we are develop and maintain the largest um, supply chain business exchange data standards uh, in the world. And it's a voluntary standard and we are, we're there to help. Uh, we're the barcode people basically. And, um, you know, we do a lot of things that have to do with, uh, op we have um, open standards for data exchange, for product data, for um, all these things that are needed to um, trace your products in a circular economy. And so absolutely we want to help. So whoever is saying they're standardizing data, information sharing, um, please take a look at our website and uh, see if that's maybe of help. So uh, would absolutely love to be more involved and help with this. Um, with regard to, yeah, and that's basically all I want to say to this. And then I made a comment there with regard to uh, economics and, um, you know, how many businesses are really doing sustainability for the right reasons, because it's the right thing to do. The planet needs this. I think that very, very few companies do that. Um, the vast majority of companies out there do this because there are regulations there or because they have managed to find a way to find an economic uh, benefit from this. They're saving money or uh, something like that. And unless that is that mindset is making it to the humanitarian sector, um, it's not really, I think it's gonna be an uphill battle. Um, and why am I saying that, that I don't think that that's the case right now because in the humanitarian supply chain, there are still a lot of inefficiencies <clears throat> because at the end of the day, there is still a lot of money wasted. Um, there's, not, there's not enough accountability as to how the money is spent. And until that really changes, um, environmental sustainability is a far distant second or third compared to, you know, also saving lives, which is the primary uh, thing that is happening in humanitarian actions. So first saving lives, then maybe some economics there in financial accountability, and then some time environmental um, conditions as well, which at the same time have, of course, an impact on the lives of the people there as well. So that's where I'm coming from. And that's why I said what I said. Thanks, Rosalie. And I think um, my response to that would be perhaps. Um, but at the end of the day, um, even if the private sector is not necessarily taking initiatives themselves for um, drivers other than money and regulation, there are um, ways in which humanitarian actors can also drive the changes in the private sector. Um, and so, you know, again, that's one of the things that we're trying to do with the REC is make sure that we are coordinating across the humanitarian sector so that we can come with sort of a coordinated voice for more environmental sustainability when we go to our suppliers and manufacturers of typical um, relief items, for example. So thank you for your comment and uh, the 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 link in the chat. Really appreciate it. I'm conscious that we are at uh, and we are over time. 
So I do want to mention to everybody, if you'd like more information, please get in touch with us at global.rec at wfp.org. We also have a number of um, different HMPW sessions that are going to be taking place uh, once tomorrow. Uh, and we have two next week. And if you are joining us in Geneva in person, we will have a exhibition stand with the Joint Initiative colleagues where we're going to be just dis displaying some of those greener item specifications as well as some of the work that we've been doing. So thank you all for joining us. Um, I really appreciate all of the, the comments and feedback. And please also feel free to fill out the survey. I'm wishing you all a wonderful rest of the day and please keep in touch. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Goodbye.